Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the final session standing between you and your lunch break, so I shan't uh, delay things too long. My name is Andy Allen. Um, I'm, uh, as Grant said earlier on, I'm a member of the Operations Working Group. Um, I've been involved in OpenStreetMap since 2007. Um, I'm the creator and developer behind OpenCycleMap.org and so the um, cycling and transport layers on the front page of OpenStreetMap.org are both my creation. Um, but it's my latest project that I'm going to be talking about today, which is um, putting the carto into OpenStreetMap cartography. This is following on quite nicely from Artem's uh, presentation, which was about Mapnik in general, but I'm going to ignore all the non-OpenStreetMap stuff to do with it. Um, and give a brief, brief background be behind Mapnik cartography as applied to the OpenStreetMap main style. Uh, I'm going to run through the, the conversion process that we did of changing it to the new Carto CSS format, um, talk about some cartographic improvements I've been making and uh, what I see as the road ahead. So a brief history of Mapnik cartography in the OpenStreetMap project follows on from that um, now famous got together, had a chat, went to the pub um, aspect. And in fact, it was November 2006 that uh, Steve Coast um, committed the results of that weekend into the, our source code repository with uh, add Mapnik stuff. What he committed was um, a style sheet, as, as Arta mentioned, is the style sheets, which is the description of um, how you want to take the OpenStreetMap data and make effectively a picture from it. Um, and that's, that's the style sheet. And this is, this is what the, this whole presentation is focused around, is the, the style sheets that we use. So this is the very first style sheet from uh, 2006 um, that um, Artem was showing the output. This is now looking behind the scenes to see what it looks like. And it's an XML format. Um, it, it goes through every feature that we want to show on the maps and explains in code how we want them to look. So if we want a post box to appear, we say we want to use this particular icon, we want it to be this big, we want it to start showing up from a particular zoom level, and here are the tags involved. So we can see here um, the amenity equals post box is the tags that we want to use. And so the style sheet just consists of this, just a, a, a few hundred lines of XML code describing what it's like. And back in 2006, this was the only option for writing style sheets. And these have all been written by hand with a whole lot of mistyping angle brackets and going back and, and typing them in again and, and not understanding why it's not working and so on. So writing these XML style sheets by hand is a long and tedious process. In 2008, Mike Magursky, who is talking to someone else over there, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, came up with an idea called Cascadenic, which is to try and move away from writing these XML files by hand. And it was started mixing in ideas from uh, cascading style sheets, which if you've ever done web development, you'll be more familiar with. It's just a different way of describing um, how you want the map to appear, but um, primarily with fewer angle um, characters on it, so mu much easier to type. But also opens up for, for more people. Uh, there are way, way more people who are familiar with making websites than there are making maps. Um, and so this was a, a big step forward in technology. And I started using it for the transport map. It was the first version of the transport layer in OpenStreetMap was done with Cascadenic. Um, but we didn't use it for the main OpenStreetMap style sheet. So this new technology came along and uh, we kind of ignored it. So a few years later, um, the guys at Mapbox released Carto CSS, which is like an evolution of Cascadenic. You can see on the right-hand side, it's still kind of like CSS style rules. Um, but they took uh, the whole system one step further by building Tile Mill, which made an entire utility around creating style sheets. Before that, we would run a little script, see the output picture, see whether it looked okay, then go back to the code editor, type some angle brackets, run a little script, look at the ne next picture. It takes forever. It's really boring. Tile was great. Um, and so after that was released, uh, the main OpenStreetMap style sheet, um, we kind of ignored the technology for a bit and just kept on with XML. So it hasn't uh, come along. Uh, Carto was much faster than Cascadenic. This is a side-by-side -side comparison that the guys made when they released it. Um, 
it's not something I'd really focused on at the time because the, the speeds didn't really bother me. Um, but when I started using tile mill, it was like, hey, great. You know, it, it takes fractions of a second, even for the most complicated style sheets. Um, but as it turns out, this comes back and bites us hard later. And so you'll see this graph again. November 2012, so basically we've spent the last three years ignoring all the technologies and, and all the things we've got going. A guy pops up on the mailing list and says, I want to find out what's going on with Mapnik style sheets. The most recent changes are from June, and the number of open tickets in the track system is more than 400. That means there's more than 400 bugs in the style sheet that we've been ignoring and have been doing. So um, whilst I'd been using Tile Mill for my own projects, I hadn't really been involved in the main OpenStreetMap style sheet. So I, I had a look. And this is a commit graph for the, the main OpenStreetMap style sheet over time with uh, 2000 or mid-2007 on the left and, and uh, a couple of days ago on the right. And you can see it kind of tails off after time, even though like these new technologies are appearing and the growth rates of OpenStreetMap generally look entirely different from this kind of graph. The activity was going down. The number of contributors to the style sheets has been dropping off as well. I mean, it only peaked about five in the one month, but you know, heading through 2012 into 2013, there's just no interest in what's going on here. This is the, the size of the style sheets over the years. So with 2007 in the, in the bottom left-hand corner, when it started, it was about 600 lines of, of XML. And it grew, but again, there's a kind of tailing off effect towards the top. It's, it's kind of asymptotic grinding to halt. The big jump in the graph where it jumps down um, was simply a reformatting uh, as we upgraded to Matnik 2. Um, but beyond that, again, everything's kind of indicating that these style sheets are, are becoming a bit unloved. And for something that's the, on the front page, it's literally the first thing anybody sees in OpenStreetMap. These are kind of worrying graphs. You know, This isn't where we want to be. But I knew what the goal was. The goal was to get it going in tile mill. All the cool kids and all the not so cool kids are using tile mill. <laughs> so I wanted to get to this position where I could just pan around, no little running a script, checking it, changing the lat long, running it again. You just want to move it around. If you want to change the color of the water, you know, just change the color of the water, hit save. This is perhaps an approach that we could use in order to like reinvigorate the styles. Um, and also just make it fun again. I mean, I, I wasn't contributing. I was one of those near infinite number of people not contributing to the style sheets because it was so boring. So I wanted to like go ahead and, and get it on. But this style sheet is huge. We saw in the previous graph, it's like just short of 10,000 lines of XML. I had no real idea whether such a big and complex style could fit into tile mill. So I decided I'd just try it and see if it worked rather than worrying whether it was going to or not. So yeah, I, I decided instead of getting involved in this discussion as to what's going on, I would just sit down, do the conversion, and, and that would be it. Um, and it wasn't anywhere near as simple as that. Um, when I posted this, like, you know, I, I started yesterday. Today, uh, I was 48% of the way through the conversion. It looked awesome. The final 52% took quite a lot longer than one day. The conversion itself. Um, was tedious and, and mind-numbing, um, <laughs> basically. I, I, I just sat down with the text editor and, and opened up the old XML style sheets on the right-hand side and typed out into the new Carta CSS format on the left-hand side. I mean, I, I'd been using both systems for years, so I kind of knew what I was doing. Um, but it, it just took ages. And oh my god, are there so many things that we render on OpenStreetMap, so many points of interest, so many icons. Um, but it was a great thing, rather than automatically converting it, which would have involved sitting down for days to write an automatic conversion script that I was only going to use once. It didn't seem the best use of time. So I just made the conversions. And I also got to see some of the kind of gnarly stuff that was in the XML that we would need to um, figure out how to do. But what was great was, as I went along each bit, watching the OpenStreetMap style build up layer at a time with casings and fills and all the buildings coming in and realizing as it went along that it was it was perfectly feasible to actually do this. What I was getting matched exactly what was in the old system and there was no there was no fundamental barrier to, to this conversion process. 
what happened after I finished it, um, we spent a few months going through in intricate detail trying to spot all the differences between my conversion and the original. Because with 10,000 lines, there were a few typos and there were a few bits that I got wrong. I had lots of help by uh, members of the community helping find all the mistakes. And I wanted to make a, a completely accurate conversion. It was tempting, it was very tempting as I went along to change all the colours and, and mess around with it. But then if, if it turned out that nobody liked my style, and everybody would ignore my style. Some other person would have to sit down and redo the conversion from scratch if they wanted a like for like one. And I didn't want anybody to go into that, so I, I did a perfectly accurate one to start with. This is one of the utilities that we used, um, which I've got uh, Tom McWright and Ian Dees to thank for, which was a side-by-side -side comparison of the old style and the new style, um, running from uh, one of the OpenStreetMap US Foundation tile servers uh, for the new style and the main uh, OpenStreetMap global tile servers for the old style. We could just drag the map around in this um, slider along the bottom here. Uh, you can drag that side by side and, and see the map changing or hopefully not changing as we went along. That was great, we got there. I'm going to talk about some of the challenges that we had as we went along. And one of them, well, perhaps the biggest one, filter mode equals first. Here's the graph I showed earlier. And the little sentence that came along beside it was, uh, again, this is the, the, the press release, if you like, for creating Carto. To achieve these tremendous improvements, in, uh, Carto uses new features introduced in the upcoming Mapnik 2, which adds an if, if, else, if, else style mode. And we're going to take a little bit of time to explain how this works. So here's a little fictitious example that I, I came up with. Um, this is some uh, of the Carto CSS rules. And it would be for a country's layer if we wanted to describe how we want the colors to apply. So we're going to color in all the countries as blue, unless this particular attribute is GBR, i.e. the UK, in which case we're going to draw a red line around it. And for all the countries which have a large population, we're going to fill them in in yellow instead. So Mapnik doesn't read this directly. Behind the scenes, it always gets converted um, back into the XML format. And this is how it comes out. The key bit here is that Carto is using filter mode equals first. So we need to have, um, it will only ever match one rule as it works through these. And as soon as it matches one rule, it will stop and, and move on to the next country. So it's fairly straightforward. We had two things that we wanted to talk about. So we've got one rule when if, um, if the second attribute matches the large number of people, if the first attribute is GBR, then this is what we want to do. We want to color, uh, draw a red line around it and color it in yellow. We have another one for if the population is large, one for if it's the UK, and then the catch-all at the bottom. So it's fairly easy to, to work through the, the style sheet and understand what's going on. Here's another style. Based on the one before, all we've done is added on an extra country and an extra population rule. So now we've got a couple of things going on depending on which country it is and depending on, on how big the population is. And the output style sheet is starting to get a little bit longer. You can, you can read through this and, and see what's going on. It's like if, if it's attribute one is value one and attribute two is value one. And we go down. And we're starting to build a bit of a cross product here. If we add in one more rule, it's only this one thing at the bottom, uh, which is the, if the GDP is big, then draw a line. It's just a fictitious example. All of a sudden, we're starting to get into lots and lots of lines. And it turns out that it's completely practical in open, uh, when doing this to write 10 lines of Carto and end up with 40,000 lines of XML. And so despite Carto being 0.1 seconds to compile and all the rest of it, it just compiles into enormous style sheets. And uh, there's a bug in the tracking system which is brilliantly titled Possibly Suboptimal Translation <laughs> to XML, um, which is the understatement of the day. Um, it's also known as combinatorial filters. And actually, we see this in OpenStreetMap all the time because we don't have feature columns. We just have tags. So like the roads layer has got highway tags, railway tags, and airway tags. And that's the three different cross products that um, mean we end up with 40,000 lines. So we needed some solutions here. The first one is to use attachments. 
which is a way of saying draw this stuff first, then draw this stuff, then draw this stuff at the end, um, and it means you don't need to do all the all the cross products. But it turns out um, this destroys any layering, um, and that's quite important for roads and bridges and things. Um, and uh, the performance is really bad on it as well. There's more details if you want at the at that bug. Um, feature queries. What we really want to do is stop having multiple columns. We just want to have like a feature column. So it seems pretty straightforward. This is how we pull all the stuff out of the database. And instead of having two columns, one called amenity and one called leisure and a, and a whole uh, load of issues, we just want one column. So we go, hey, OK, let's coalesce these two column titles together. Uh, coalesce in an SQL statement means pick the first one of these that isn't null. So if, there's, if it's got an amenity tag, then we'll use the amenity tag. If it's got a leisure tag, then we'll use the leisure tag. But that's got a little bit of a problem because we don't want if it's if somebody's put in a false tag into OpenStreetMap like amenity equals forest, or land use equals pub, or something like that. We we don't want to accidentally start rendering things because all the volunteers will just get completely confused as to what we want to do. So we add a little text prefix to each thing before we join them together. So this just says add amenity underscore to the tag. And when we're rendering, we'll make sure that we're not like mixing up the tags here. So that's fine. But there's a little bit of a problem there because uh, we don't want to like block out something that we're not interested in. So if it said amenity equals country club, leisure is golf course, then amenity wouldn't be null. But we would never see the golf course tag. So we always want to just screen these columns first by saying, well, it's only if amenity is parking or school or something else that we're interested in. If it's any other unrecognized tag, set it to null first, and then do the prefixing and then coalesce them together. Um, and that kind of works. But we're still at the bottom. We're selecting a lot of extra data from the database, and that ruins the performance. So we add these little extra bits in it. It's starting to get a bit complicated. And uh, this, this is what it looks like. Um, that's the actual SQL query from the, the current thing. I'm hoping at some point we'll get together and get all the brain trusts together and figure out a different way of doing it. Um, but we end up with quite large SQL statements. We had more performance challenges. It's interesting, Paul Norman, who's uh, down here, did a, a, a lot of analysis on this. Um, Despite all of these things and all the recoding, we ended up with very similar performance results. The red line in the, is uh, OpenStreetMap Carto, I think, or the other way around. Yeah, no, red is OpenStreetMap Carto. It's very slightly slower. There's a common myth that Carto things are much slower, but honestly, it's, it's not that bad. So long as you don't accidentally make a 40,000 line XML file. And he came up with the, perhaps my favorite thing is that um, we can just change like two lines in the code to make it 6% faster when it comes to buildings. Because um, Mapnik has got lots of advanced things for saying if the feature disappears off the edge of the area that you're rendering, just chop off the geometry here and don't worry about rendering um, all the rest of it. And that's normally how we speed it up. But actually, most of these buildings you can see here for London, they all lie within. There's not much point in checking out each one individually to see which ones are on the map and which ones are off the map. They're, they're pretty, you know, the, the overlap around the edge is pretty small. So we nuked all that and got a 6%. Yeah. Yes, yeah, 6% increase. Easy money, kind of work. But that's just playing around behind the scenes and getting things to look the same. I really want to improve the cartography here as well and get lots of people to help improve the cartography. If you strip the colors, you realize that everything is a little bit mental in our style. The motorways are narrower than the trunk roads are. Um, the trunk road casing is quarter of a pixel wide, whereas the residential casing is two pixels wide. It really doesn't hang together. Um, and it's probably we just don't notice it because the colors are predominant. So I'm working through all this, trying to figure out where it's gone wrong over the years make it easier to work with in the future as well. Or looking at maps like this, um, we're rendering text names across rivers that we're not rendering features for. This ferry has, is only a proposal, but we happen to be drawing the name on it. We've got a blue dashed line here and a blue dashed line here. One of them is a cycleway and the other one's a marina. Um, if anybody can recognize and explain what this red and white dashed line, what that red and white dashed line, what this red and white dashed line, these red and white dashed lines, and what this brown dashed line with a red dashed line over the top of it means, <laughs> then I'll be handing out prizes later on. So. 
<laughs> I'm sure you can. Um, so, like, I, I want us to take a step back and, and try and improve the cartography because it is something that lots of people see straight off. We don't need hundreds of tiny eight-point text labels everywhere. We don't need a kind of blurred mass of colors where I don't know what anybody would use this map for. Like, nobody looks at it and goes, how do I drive from A to B? Because you end up staring at all the buildings and <laughs> all the little green dots everywhere. It's it's evolved over the years, but like we need to we need to go from scratch. So the road ahead is I want people to give feedback on the cartography from both mappers, cartographers, people who are interested. Let me know what you think. Let me know what bugs you. Let me know what ideas you have for improving things. I'm working to make it easier to customize so that we can put some of these things in, and also people uh, can use it for their own projects. Like, rather than taking that huge style sh um, XML stuff and wrangling it yourself, grab this style, whack it into Tile Mill, change all the colors, use it for your own project. It's, uh, it's much easier now. If you're going to help out, please don't ask for more icons to appear. We've got lots of icons. I will add icons later, but not yet. There's so much more th important things we could be doing. If you're ever using this kind of stuff, I've got a few tips. And pull requests are welcome at the end. So that's it. Thanks very much. <laughs> Any questions? Paul. So the, the question is um, whether the problems are because we're uh, just rendering too many things and am I planning on pulling out some features? I haven't decided yet, to be honest. Um, there's conflicting requirements. Not only is it the map that most people see when they start with OpenStreetMap, but it's also the map that most mappers use to check that everything's OK. So when they log on to ID and press Save, um, and it says, yeah, it's saved. People don't believe it until they go back to the map and, and see something appearing on the map. So the, there is huge pressure. I mean, to be honest, of those 400 outstanding tickets, about 385 of them are the Mapnik layer doesn't show this obscure feature that's my pet project. So there's a tension there. There's a lot of people want to see more things on it. There's a tension that we want to see, like, you know, nicer maps to encourage more people to join in. And I'm not sure where the balance lies. At the moment, I've got a kind of half-fixed moratorium and adding more stuff in. I'm pulling out stuff which is like long deprecated. But apart from that, I, I want to focus on improving what we have to start with. And we'll, we'll see where it goes after that. The, the question is, is there a working group looking at home page style sheets or, or things similar to that? Um, there are other people who are looking at the, the rest of the page, like the rest of the website and, and what people's experience are when they're looking at it. Um, but no, there isn't any group who are looking at the, the map side of things. Or if there is a group, uh, you know, hi, that's me um, and, and all my friends up here to helping me. So, you know. Um, I'm, I really want to get more feedback. I really want to get more people involved. And most of this project is just making it easier for other people to get involved as a kind of like, you know, um, enabling step to make this work. Any more? Mike. Hello. Okay, the, the question is, what are my thoughts on, on federating the cartography so that there's um, country-appropriate cartography in different parts of the world? I would really love to do that. Um, it's, it's quite obvious when you look at um, the choices of uh, when roads appear and zoom levels and things like that, um, that it really depends on what co which country you're talking about. If you've got somewhere like Siberia, you really want to be drawing roads at a different zoom level than if you're um, over Central Europe. Um, the, the physical geography of the world does change around the place. Um, we don't have all the parts of the technology to do that, but the main thing we don't have is the manpower to do that. Um, until I get 
like four or five people helping with the one global style sheet, then setting it up so that there's different aspects in different areas is just a recipe for it not working. I do think it's the future. I do think it's the way forward. Um, but we need to get more people involved before we've got the capacity to handle that kind of stuff. This, this, sorry, the question is, um, how does this work relate to Open Cycle Map? Um, all, almost entirely independent. It's, it's just based on my experience with all the, um, uh, with all the different tools and technologies. So I've, I've learned all this on, on my own time for Open Cycle Map and the Transport Map and, and things like that, and I'm applying them to, to the um, to the main Open Street Map style. But otherwise, they're completely independent. They, they work independently with different style sheets and different servers. Okay, one last question. Oh, it's a big hand. Uh, can I share some comments with water and working on water data? Um, at the moment in the style sheets, we do very little with water data other than just kind of coloring in the same blue color everywhere. Um, it's the way that OpenStreetMap works with water data is quite difficult. Um, and it, to be able to do more interesting things, uh, drawing outlines around lakes uh, um, seems like a really easy thing to get started, but it turns out most of our major rivers are broken down into individual polygons, which are kind of attached side by side. And if we start drawing the outlines of it, we end up with spurious lines um, everywhere. I haven't, other than putting oceanic bathymetry data into it, I haven't seen any kind of compelling water cartography um, for me to steal ideas from. But if somebody does have a map that they like and they think is cool, please show me it and I'll try and figure out how they, how they make it look good. And we can make our map look good too. Okay, I think that's it. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs>